Dr. Bran Govard, Director Integrated Development Program and CIMI representative for the Americas, who will give a welcome message. Please, Dr. Bram. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening. We have uh, now over 80 people connected from uh, all over the globe. Uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America on this uh, wonderful, and in, in Mexico at least, very rainy uh, morning. We wanted rain, we got it. So the field and the, and the, and the farmers will, will, will be happy. Uh, as you all know, these are challenging times. These are times where we need to stick together and really uh, make a difference. And in order to do that in this uh, crisis, CIMIT has identified three phases of response phase one to deliver we need to deliver on our uh, promises we need to operate safely and we need to support our stakeholders during this period by delivering as much as we can on the project and on the commitments we have and the second phase is a phase where we want to contribute look at simit's current capabilities to contribute to the impact uh, of the COVID measures on the economy, on our stakeholders and uh, on the farmers. What can we offer? Post-harvest solution, smart mechanization, et cetera, et cetera. And that mapping uh, has happened between the CGIR and CIMIT in different uh, fora. And last but not least, we have a phase three exercise in which we want to shape the future and to look at how do we create value in the new uh, normal how can we uh, and how do we see the future and what should CIMIT do? What should we do more? What should we do differently? And in the frame of that thinking exercise of uh, how the future would look like, there's a couple of uh, groups looking at scenarios. And this week, Friday, we will present for, to you for your input after the overwhelming response on the survey with uh, around 300 responses. Uh, we constructed some scenarios and we will present those to you on uh, Friday. Uh, while we also want to keep uh, thinking and provoking our critical thinking in the institution by having a series of top-notch uh, 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 presentations by uh, high-level experts. And it's therefore my pleasure and my honor to present to you this morning uh, uh, Dr. Molly Chan. She's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she holds appointments in the Department of Agronomy, the Nelson Institute, and the Global Health Institute. She's also appointed joint faculty at the U.S. Department of Energy, Oak Ridge National Lab, which many of us know for its famous and infamous history, where she shares the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Energy and Environmental Science Directorate and sits on the lab director's uh, SAC. From 2006 to 2011, she served as the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Director of West Wisconsin Experimental Station. And in 2009, she was called by uh, President Obama to Washington to serve as the Deputy and Acting Undersecretary of Agriculture, overseeing four USDA research and statisticals, eight uh, statistical agencies. Molly was also the inspirer of a fantastic team of thinkers uh, called, knowledge, called Knowledge Systems for Sustainability between CIMIT, IASA, CSIRO, Wisconsin University, uh, and uh, other uh, key uh, research uh, institutes like Enrel and others. So it is my pleasure and my honor to present to you Molly's uh, uh, reflection and presentation, Resilient Agri-Food Systems and their roles in the national and global security. If you have questions at the end of the seminar, there will be a Q&A, but please write those questions in the chat so we can efficiently read them out to Molly. Molly, the floor is all yours, and thank you again for accepting this invitation. Well, my pleasure, and let me please add my good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you who have taken the time to sign in. I'm really impressed with the attendance. And uh, also, I have to say, uh, thank you, Brahm. I'm very impressed with the leadership that CIMIT and the CG as a whole is offering uh, the world at this extremely challenging time. I think this three-phased approach where you hold your own, you maintain your existing commitments, you uh, consider the uh, opportunities that and the unique opportunities that the CG may have uh, to, uh, to make a difference. And then you take hold of the future and shape it through this uh, summit wide exercise that you will, uh, I guess be learning considerably more about by the end of the year. I mean, by the end of the week, each of these weeks does feel a little like a year. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I'm going to describe, so many of you probably know me as a plant breeder, and I'm going to say a little bit about that. Um, I still continue my plant breeding work at Cornell University. I've been gone from there 15 years, but um, my program there is run by a person who was a technician, graduate student, postdoc, research associate, and now tenured associate professor, Michael Mazurik. So I do maintain a crop breeding, uh, a very direct links with crop breeding. And I am among the accomplishments Brown mentioned, extremely proud of the fact that my plant breeding program has varieties in use on six continents, both commercial and subsistence, act, act, or distributed under more than 60 active commercial licenses. So I really uh, walk the walk when it comes to impact through plant varieties. But I'm going to talk in this seminar about work that I began about 10 years ago when I concluded my government service to the US Department of Agriculture. And I caught sight of some, what I understood to be very significant gaps in our understanding of what we now call agri-food systems. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that journey for me because I understand many of you have scientific backgrounds very similar to mine and also uh, aspirations to make a difference, aspirations you and I share. Um, then I'm going to describe a swing to who cares about this work. Because who cares about this work? Who understands this work in my world, first and foremost, most easily, is not, the, is not my scientific peers. In fact, my scientific peers hear the word system. They think of mathematics they were never trained in and often tune out. In contrast, the, the condition of our agri-food systems from local scales to regional or national to continental and global, the condition of those systems is fundamentally important, yes, to the human condition and our ability to develop, but also to managing downside risk. And so this seminar is going to be a bit of a journey in my exploration from the background we share into what that downside risk looks like, who cares about it, how they care about it, and what we may be doing about it. That has brought me into new company. And so I know we will terminate this seminar very sharply at the bottom, at the top of the next, or bottom of the next hour. Um, and that is, I, I am now working with a government agency I never thought I would be working with um, that is specific, that is part of our Department of Defense, because finally this topic has arrived. So I'm going to start uh, just by highlighting that I conduct this work by and large as an independent research group called the John Research Group. We, are, we operate under a formal cooperative research and development agreement with the US Department of Agriculture. I sit in US government space, so not in university space, although on our university campus, and I am funded by NASA. It is a very unusual configuration for someone with a background in agricultural research, but it is the configuration I've had to establish because some of our research is not very welcome on our university campus because of its implications for national security. I do no sensitive or classified work. I wanna make that very, very clear. That is both a matter a practical matter and a matter of principle. Um, all the work that I do is unclassified and open. So I'm going to start with the, with the first slide. I'm very proud of the fact that I am descended from a wheat breeder. And so my relationship to Simit goes back even before Simit existed. This is my double great grandfather, William Saunders, who is the father of Marquis Wheat. And I put this slide up here, not to read through all the details, but to say that when William Saunders was working, he was the first 
director of the Canadian Agricultural Experiment System. Uh, and so my great grandfather grew up at on the Ottawa Central Experimental Farm campus, um, pollinating just like my kids did, um, pollinating wheat and many other kinds of crops because professional agricultural research was just starting in the 1880s. I will argue in this seminar that we are at a similar point today. And Simmet's vision is crucially important for this. We have operated for more than 100, almost 150 years on the vision of men like my great grandfather, double great grandfather. He imagined that we would uh, professionalize crop breeding. We would commercialize plant varieties. We would create economic ecosystems uh, that, would, uh, that would carry it forward. Um, sorry, I'm hearing some audio interference. Um, and so uh, the rise in professional agricultural research was, was really revolutionary. But, but the vision goes back at least a good 150 years. Um, as a result of the success of that vision, we have been stunningly successful. And we, meaning all of the more than 100 participants on this call, collectively, this is a graphic, continues on, this is a little bit old, um, but you can see that from around the middle of the 20th century, output in, and productivity have continued to grow. That is agricultural outputs. This happens to be the United States, but the world graphs look in, in general, very similar. And the red line is important because about that time we realized that we needed to focus also on resource use efficiency. So we collectively have been stunningly successful. In fact, we have been so successful that we achieved a major human milestone. We, by all estimates, have achieved today caloric per capita sufficiency. That is our agricultural system today is estimated to be able to produce enough calories for every single person to have what they need for nutritional health every day. But my great grandfather could not have imagined agriculture on the scale we now realize it. He could not have imagined the extent to which Western ways of agriculture have spread around the world. And he could not have imagined that we would have turned relatively fragile or marginal lands into um, bread baskets. Uh, and so it, it cannot be, we cannot be faulted then, but we must now ask how stable are our food systems, not just our agricultural output, but our food system. What is a food system? And how much more growth, how much more, uh, how much more of that achievement can the world tolerate without very consequential types of collapses. This is a figure taken from a graph of Rabobank showing one depiction of a food system. Food systems are a really significant part and agriculture is embedded in this, but this is not just agriculture, of our species massive binge on fossil energy. So if you think about the world as a ball of rock orbiting the sun, intercepting sunlight for billions of years and through photosynthesis storing some portion of that, the last 200 or so 250 years has seen a huge unleashing of that stored energy. And most of the ills we worry about, climate change, activated nitrogen, obesity. These can be traced to the laws of thermodynamics, too much of that fossil energy being liberated into, into the rest of the world. In, with that, with that uh, lens of energy being something we can exploit without barrier, a proposition I think we now understand has to be re-examined 
And I think this effort that Simit is doing to shape the future is crucially important in this, in this process. Um, we now have evolved global food systems. Also, of course, informal agricultural markets and smaller scale systems are very, very important as well. But these global food systems now affect as context really all the work we do, and especially for CIMIT, responsible for two crops or sets of crops that are so dominant in the world's population's um, nutritional stability. These diagrams are very relevant to you. What are the properties of the global food systems we have developed? They are optimized. They are very intensely optim optimized for the following conditions, globalized trade regime, peacetime, the, the um, dominant forcing driver has been efficiency and low cost. And this has all occurred in a relatively stable environment that we've enjoyed between the and middle of last century and about 10 years ago, say. So when I came out of government, I began to ask very different questions about this same system that you will all recognize. To what extent is this system uncontrollable? Even though we, we depend on it at, at a level we cannot, that could not be more important, to what extent have we created a system that is formally uncontrollable? To what extent is this system fragile? And in fact, to what extent is this system, because it has been so marginal or so focused on efficiency and low cost, to what extent have we actually opened up massive vulnerabilities that in fact, the world now is exposed to because we have failed to examine these downside risks. So I'm going to tell you all as a plant breeder, a little story um, that in that where the CG collaboration was crucially important, that was where why I as a plant breeder pivoted. And I wanna use the next few slides to emphasize the difference between crop yield, food security, the term food security and the term food systems. These are three distinct concepts. And it's really important for us as plant breeders who have primarily been, or many of us plant breeders or those managing agricultural systems for output to realize that we have equated high yields with food security and stable food systems. And I'm going to tell you a, a real story that shows why that is not a good idea. Um, in the middle, in the early part of the aughts, a set of white fly or white fly transmitted viral diseases came sweeping into West Africa. And the uh, CG, the ICRASAT Center in Bamako with two of the research fellows in my group, uh, Fred uh, Rotunde and Ava Veltzin, um, were noticing that tomato yields were, uh, were destroyed. And tomatoes, of course, for those of you in West Africa, you know, or those of you who've worked there, know that tomato is actually a very important part of the diet in West Africa. And about this time, a very uh, vigorous regional trade was taking shape. Um, I was asked by the USAID to come in along with Bob Gilbert at Davis and a number of other scientists from around the world and uh, begin a very uh, intensive research program to address this challenge. This would involve years of research, hundreds of thousands of US dollars in investment. We would genetically engineer resistance to this virus and, uh, and share that uh, throughout the region. Well, as a plant breeder, I knew that in fact, there had been 20 years of investment in white fly transmitted viral disease resistance in industry. And I wondered if some of those materials that already existed, that were already resistant, heat tolerant, and a suitable type could potentially be helpful 
in West Africa. So long story short, we very quickly leveraged the existing variety trialing infrastructure, which had been used primarily for millet and sorghum. We worked with AVRDC and we were seeing results from an a set of Israeli lines and a US line, uh, line from US company that were beautiful. They were stored tomato production. All of a sudden, we call this telephone breeding. Um, so instead of an elaborate scientific project, all I had to do was join the dots between a breeding program that existed in a commercial um, area for one region and the only, they got free trialing as long as they agreed to consider licensing and selling the seed in West Africa, which they did. So the back picture shows the former, the front picture sh shows our success. Very exciting for plant breeders. My, I had two graduate students that were in Bamako uh, in the summer of 2007. So I, the first picture I showed you was 2005, this is 2007. This is a victory for plant breeders. Look at all those tomatoes. We have hit our yield target. Um, and we did so very, very quickly, which we always think is good. People always fault us for being slow. Well, this was really fast. It was so fast that we were able to meet all the demand, both fresh and processing. These are tomato packets sitting on the loading dock of a, of a um, processing plant in Bamako. When we began the project, we knew enough to make sure that this perishable product had a market. However, we did not think to ask whether this processing plant would have the power to operate. It did not. These tomatoes rotted on that loading dock. And this photograph shows a person I aimed to benefit by my work taking these tomatoes, my success, and USAID's success and dumping it into that canal. Those women could not sell their tomatoes. We had too many tomatoes. And those who had grown the varieties I was so pleased with ended up losing money. And so this was my personal uh, acquaintance with uh, with a really important concept for me, which was that my yield, my focus on yield did not always create the benefits that I imagined. Now, the good news about that story is eventually that, that evened out. And we have had a very successful run with tomatoes in West Africa, which highlights one of the most important things about thinking in systems systems are very dynamic, they move. There's always uncertainty and there's always, formally speaking, complexity. Now as a plant breeder, I was never taught about this word complexity. It is different from complicated, but food systems are both complicated and formally complex. And so I'm going to, on this slide, introduce you to some very different questions that I believe Simit will take the lead through your process this week with, um, with a consideration of shaping a post-COVID world. We, as agricultural researchers, I will argue, need to ask the following kinds of questions. And these are new questions and different questions. And we don't know how yet to ask these questions. So we will need new friends, new, we will need new discoveries and we will need new tools. What about patterns of consumption? What about control of production and distribution? What about the digital vulnerabilities we have opened up and the potential for their exploitation or even accidental interruption? How do the background trends, in no small part because of our work in agricultural research, of increasing global affluence, although now we are seeing a huge impact of COVID on this, um, trends of urbanization and population growth, 
intensified demand or how will these COVID shocks affect demand uh, and create potential instability? So all of what I've said so far in this talk boils down to my uh, encouragement to every one of us to ask ourselves about how our work fits into food systems. This is a slide I was given last week when I gave us a similar keynote kind of talk, uh, only on it, it was on very short notice, again, early Monday morning, my time, for a research sponsor in the US government called the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, also known as DARPA. Why is DARPA thinking about food systems? This is literally the slide they gave me because they didn't think my Rabobank slide was current. Because we all have come to understand that the condition of our food systems is crucially important to human welfare all around the world, developing and developing developed countries, and that the function of our food systems are really important for power, economics, finance, as well as the physical flow of materials, energy, water. And so this is the, we think of these di diagrams as the spaghetti diagrams. There are many versions of them. Food security sits up here in the left-hand corner, food security being ultimately an economic statistic that is, uh, that is calculated nationally based on uh, production, export, import. So we have to remember that food security in its formal use has a meaning and it sits up here in the left. Food security is not all of this. Food security sits up here in the left and you'll notice the way they have linked regular security. So um, is there sufficiency? Uh, civil security, water security, energy security, economic security, and then politics and governance. So we sit, those of us who link agriculture to food security, remembering that word is actually, a use, means a lot of different things and we have to be very careful about how we use it, especially those of us that have wrapped ourselves in the mantle of food security as if that uh, that is enough. It is not enough. Um, we, but you can see how they see food security nesting right up in this corner. So I'm going to move now to take you through a plant breeder's journey into the realm of the term security, especially when it's called not food security, but national security. And I realize some of this is US centric and I apologize for that. It happens to be the country I'm in. Um, and this country has, uh, has been going through as many countries in the world, some very, um, very uh, eventful times. Um, and so please forgive me for uh, whatever degree this may seem parochial to you. It is that I operate in this context and that my work has elevated to uh, the recognition of the best funded and uh, most sophisticated science funding agencies in my government. So I want to just say a little bit about the global food system and introduce you to uh, to thinking about it in a way that will, I hope, uh, be familiar. The global food system is comprised of mathematically complex, cons but, and highly consolidated food, financial, that is agriculture, food, financial, and energy networks. Um, we cannot overlook the importance of finance. Um, I apologize for that typo. And um, when the grain that you all produce leaves the fields, ultimately 70 to 90% of that grain is traded and managed by this group of companies, highly consolidated, opaque uh, traders who make money literally about 
on lack of transparency and who deliver that grain into a whole host of facilities, buyers, sellers, and products. It's extraordinarily complex. Now, I'm going to switch gears and introduce a really important new word, risk. Risks and threats in that system I've just described are also formally complex and potentially interrelated, this is obvious, but in largely uncharacterized ways. Why? Because we've never thought about food systems this way. Good intentions, such as those that the over 100 participants on this call share, we all share the best of intentions. But if we're operating on flawed assumptions, such as I was in Mali, my actions with the best of intentions can result in diverse, potentially even cascading, and we've seen this over and over again, unintended negative consequences. And so this is a slide I've shown for several years. Um, you can imagine when COVID hit, how many phone calls I got, because we put fiscal crises on this. Failure of critical international infrastructure, um, failure of regional and global governance. Um, we were emphasizing involuntary migration at the time. Um, and one thing that we have not, well, actually we did in 2017 and we have in some sense, but we have not in general as a community dealt with the potential we are setting up by making everything smart for various types of cyber incidents, both intentional and unintentional, uh, either for financial gain or for political or, um, or, uh, or geopolitical intent. Um, so we saw a COVID inspired or COVID, um, COVID result of the result of COVID, we saw food crises. We saw for the first time in, in, the, in my living memory in the United States, bare supermarket shelves and panic buying. 10 years ago, when I was in government, I was asked the following, and this was a very radical question. Madam Undersecretary, please tell me one thing. This was a, a grouchy uh, national security official. Why are we subsidizing U.S. subsidizing the mining of fossil water? In other words, the just long-term and permanent destruction of agricultural lands in the U.S. and sending that subsidizing the export of that fossil water to another country. It didn't matter at that time what other country it was. What are the implications of this choice? He asked me as Undersecretary of Agriculture for the long-term stability and success of US agriculture? Well, I did not have an answer for him, which was very uncomfortable for me. He then asked me when I said, like, basically, I don't know, to a very fair and important question, are you telling me that the US does not have clear, consistent, trusted ways to share dynamic information about food systems and the potential implications for our nation's security as well as global security. Are you telling me that, Madam Undersecretary? As a matter of fact, we don't track our food systems that way. In fact, we didn't even have a concept of food systems. We have lots of yield estimates and separately we track critical infrastructures and many other attributes but I'll get right on that, sir. Okay, well, that was 10 years ago. I'm still on this. Um, so during the last 10 years, we have seen the advent of the concept of food systems. And my group has led along with this amazing network that CIMIT has been a part of since Tom Lumpkin's inauguration of the big CRPs. Um, Simon has been an essential thought partner and action partner in leading both the, uh, the science of agriculture and the uh, development of a way of thinking about this term we literally made up called food systems shock. The knowledge systems for sustainability collaborative has been crucial because it is a global 
research network that is post-disciplinary. We understand that we are always dealing with human systems, human physical systems, if we are operating in, um, in with, with an applied output. And you all are very familiar about the leadership the CG has taken with climate change, but this slide lists a number of other um, dynamics that will directly impinge on our success in agriculture. I'm gonna just take us quickly through some snapshot slides. I don't expect you to read these, but I wanna give you a feel for the progression of the reports. This was 2014. This was the first stake in the ground. It was a very short, almost trivial report, but it, it socialized the term food insecurity and, and introduced it as a specific threat to finance. But that threat was unmodeled. For those of you who are modelers, that threat or risk was unmodeled. It did inspire some collaborations with the actual profession in the UK especially, which have been very transformative. The risk we are talking about in agricultural systems is generally unmodeled. Just because it's unmodeled does not mean it's not real, but it does mean that the entire risk apparatus is formally blind. And so in 2015, my group led, along with Alec Jones in the UK, a scenario construction exercise that has had probably more impact than my 100 whatever peer reviewed scientific publications put together. Uh, released in 2015, we took an El Nino year. Again, Simit was a core player in the construction of this scenario. We introduced the concept of multiple breadbasket failure uh, and, and food system shock. And so in 2016, it was announced at the World Food Prize that my group had been selected to join with a, the, an intelligence agency in the US government for an entirely unclassified project called Food Security, Food Systems, and National Security Interests. And we will make this deck available so you can read um, the aspiration. It is uh, practically delusional, um, but it has offered a great target for us going forward. That uh, CRADA, that Cooperative Research and Development Agreement with the US National Geospatial Intelligence Agency produced this report. I wanna especially acknowledge there were three of us that were co-first authors, Tony Genados, who unfortunately passed away last year from pancreatic cancer, a top-notch Department of Energy uh, modeler, Chris Justice, who leads Harvest and GeoGlam, and I collaborated along with uh, IASA, the former USDA economist and a junior colleague to produce this report. Simit was, was a key collaborator there. And by this time we had convinced very influential people like Robert Muir Wood, um, who serves as kind of the analyst's analyst where he said a focus on food systems in catastrophe modeling, particular subset of modeling is long overdue. I am so excited by the incredibly sophisticated approaches that are now massing around agriculture and food systems. Many of the people who are bringing their tools to have no background in agriculture or food systems or food, but are finding our workspace very compelling. Why? 2017 was the worst famine year since World War II. Despite our best efforts in agricultural research, largely as a result of intra and interstate conflict, um, putting mass migration into play, our best efforts resulted in something that we in the CG didn't even study because we didn't think we'd have it. I remember Schengen saying, we don't have an effort at if we on famine because we didn't think it was going to be an issue. Meanwhile, none of us have dealt with the interstate conflict issue. We are not equipped. So, but our material passes through a number of places in the world as on its way to feed the people we care about uh, that are potentially very unstable. Um, this graph made the rounds in Washington was um, really compelling about the crisis in 2008-9. Again, Simit was very involved in stabilizing this situation. 
but the red lines indicate conflict and the uh, black line is just the uh, global food price index. Um, and uh, this study's actually been repeated uh, with some more reliable methods, but the result holds. 2018, we published a, a glossy, again, a not, this is a peer reviewed glossy publication jointly with NASA, co-branded by NASA and Thomson Reuters on global food system stability and risk. In this case, I'm gonna just take you through, again, we use scenarios, multiple breadbasket failure, multi-state food crisis. We used real life situation that many of you are frontline on. This one falls outside of your regular space, exploitation of the food system by violent non-state actors, which we all know occurs in, in very troubled parts of the world. And scenario four, um, great, introduce the concept of gray zone activities. Gray zone tactics, sorry, let me get my cursor there, refer to adversaries employing instruments of power often asymmetric and ambiguous in character that are not direct use of acknowledged regular military forces. Food systems constitute a perfect non-military instrument of power that can be used for destabilizing purposes. This is a study I commend to you. It's on our group's website, www.johnresearchgroup.net. You can see it goes so far as to list decomposed drivers, and this argument, this uh, publication argued particularly for developing new frameworks to study food system stability and the idea that we should have some sort of food system risk index. And I would love to invite Simit as you shape the future to step up fully into a global effort to come up with an index. There are many indices used by finance um, there's a strong sense we need a food system risk index. I'll pause here just a minute to highlight the importance of the CG big data effort, mobilizing not only research data, but operational data on food systems, and then learning to do research on that operational data is one of the biggest challenges I see for, ooh, let me say one more thing, for the research community. Essential to success will be public-private partnerships because we in the research community will need data that the private sector has. It's not government data, it's not research data. And that's why my group has for years maintained a strategic alliance with Thomson Reuters because they have data. This is the US national security strategy. This is the, uh, this is the benchmark document, the core document for the US national security strategy. So this is a whole part of our government I generally don't deal with. I'm gonna finish this presentation just highlighting the importance of the word resilience. It was shocking for us in 2017, remember what happened in our election in 2016, that the word resilience showed up. Why? Because it was very clear that the threat by threat by threat approach was not going to add up to security or resilience in the face of adversity. Climate change in particular, the magnitude and complexity of the extreme events that hit our country through the teens made it clear to everyone, regardless of politics, that resilience, and it was defined here, the ability to withstand and recover rapidly from deliberate attacks, accidents, natural disasters, as well as unconventional stresses, shocks, and threats to our economy and our democracy. This was a huge triumph for people like me and the network of people who included a number of general officers in the military I never thought I would be collaborating with. I spent my summer getting literally in, acting within my Congress, which I had never done before, to get an amendment to a bill that goes through every year that funds our military to require a report on the global food system and vulnerabilities relevant to Department of Defense missions. It had to be Department of Defense missions because it's a Department of Defense bill. So this was a landmark 
first and I just show you a picture of what the bill actually looked like. I, I, it is so important to me that I have a poster size version of it behind me. We have still, this report came out last year. Um, it is wildly unsatisfactory because uh, there's really no way for the Department of Defense to do what we told them to do. Last year, also, this report came out. Uh, I served as peer reviewer for it, another Lloyd's report, another sort of landmark report, and I put a few of ours up here now um, on evolving risks in the global food supply. I commend to you. We also, KSS had a great influence on this report coming out of the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. These are all on our website. GAR Distilled um, is a very succinct uh, representation of the, the arrival of systemic risk, including risk to food through food systems. I was invited to be a co-author on this, which was commissioned at the US Army War College by the man who is currently our chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that is the most powerful military official in the United States, commissioned this report, which was soft launched last year. Um, and then this is a report we contributed to showing that um, agriculture and food remains important. The GAR-19 had this uh, diagram in it, and I know we're getting short on time, so I'm just gonna finish up saying this kind of cascading risk with the GAR-19, now remember, this is the UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, every kind of disaster. Here is the word, we, KSS, we, Simmet, made up. And it was used to highlight this consequence of systemic failure. And look at what's down here at the end of the cascade. Food riots, food insecurity, war, civil unrest and migration. This is a tattered page I tore out of Science Magazine last year. It's an advertorial showing that in, um, in Eastern intellectual cultures, the study of systems is normal. Um, complex world, simple rules, the school system science at Beijing. Three years ago, I began teaching at University of Wisconsin a course called Systems Thinking which is also on our website. And I would be glad to share that with Simit going forward as you think about shaping the world. The last sentence of this actually got this man disappeared. He said, the scientists contend that the time has come to bring the God that is the power of systems thinking down to earth. He recently wrote that system science in China is under a rationalistic grip with the scientific leg long and the democratic leg short. Systems approaches should not just be a convenient tool in experts' hands, such as the application of systems thinking in mass detention or um, political manipulation. They should be a powerful weapon in people's hands for building a fair, just, and prosperous society. My friends tell me that this man has disappeared. That is the power of the term resilience. So resilience is a system property. It is not an additive result of a bundle of silver bullet solutions like my variety or your fertilizer, um, or even the result of incrementally less environmentally damaged while we continue to produce the crops that drive those food systems. And sustainability, especially as it has been defined to mean incrementally less damage, does not equal a resilient system. When we build resilient systems in national security, which I am now doing officially as, an, as working, uh, part of my company is now supported by DARPA, again, working unclassified for the benefit of humanity, as far as I'm concerned, when we build resilient systems in national security, we think about dis for, and this is semiconductors, pharma, whatever it is, we think about disaggregating the system. We think about that phenomenon of consolidation as a, as a manufacturer, whether it's digital consolidation or physical, it is it, it creates enormous vulnerabilities. So a very simple tactic that requires an understanding of the system is to reduce the number of nodes that represent potential single points of failure. In other words, reduce the points that can result in systemic risk. 
we create redundancy in both the physical and virtual realms. We secure two-way flows of materials and information. Masagro is the most dramatic example I can think of of this globally. We obscure and eliminate vulnerabilities in the system, whether they are vulnerabilities to accident or climate change, extreme events, or series of extreme events, or intentional interference. And we understand that everything is connected and everything is always changing, we will always have incomplete knowledge of the systems in which we are intervening and we are always intervening. Therefore, monitoring for intended and unintended consequences at the same time, which is a precept of system thinking, is essential. When I was working at USDA, I had the privilege of bringing a colleague from my same state into a national gathering. And this is, I'm gonna just, this is the last slide. We spent the day, uh, we spent the day telling him about all the things we usually tell our audience about um, in terms of our successes, our varieties, our, our agricultural practices, our efficiencies, our reduced nutrient use, our slightly better, whatever, we tell, two days. I, I went and sat down next to him. I didn't know him very well at that time. And I asked him, and this man was from a, a nation, a Native American nation in my state. And he, uh, I leaned over and I said to him, Chad, what do you think of all of this? And there was this long silence and he was looking at me. I could tell he was sizing me up as we say in English, uh, deciding whether he was gonna tell me the truth or not. And so what he said after a long pause was our ethos, his tribe's ethos is that we need to learn to live within our means. And so as you think about a post COVID world and some its impact and the role of agriculture in that impact, this precept felt very important to me. And with that, I'm going to conclude uh, my talk. I know we're right at time and I will be happy to stay on. I know Ram likes to wrap up, but we, I'm also happy to take any conversations offline and continue to support you through your process working on these uh, scenarios. Thank you, Molly, for this very exciting talk. And I think it gave uh, a lot of uh, messages to us, but it also showed uh, where some of the efforts are ending up. And, and I think it is a message. It was a clear presentation and a message of care, but a, a message of caring, but also a message of, uh, of hope. So uh, I'm going to ask everybody if you have, we understand if you have to disconnect, but also if you have another 10 minutes, we will allow for a couple of uh, Q&A, so we understand those of you that have to disconnect, but those that can stay another 10 minutes, we want to enjoy a couple of, of questions. Molly, one of, the, Molly one, of, one of the questions is, we are conditioned to simplify complexity, compartmentalize it. How do you think we can bring about major shifts in mindset and action around embracing complexity, especially for the CGIR, which has a strong culture and history of specialization for crops? Any thoughts on that? Beautiful question. Thank you to whomever asked it. Um, it is all that is in some ways the question. So, and by we always say in systems thinking, it's not about the answers, it's about the questions. And so that is the right question. And asking questions as scientists, that's our job. But if you continue to ask that question every single time you approach a challenge and to begin to explore and become comfortable with the term complexity, what it really means. I'm surprised I cleaned up my office for this, but even though my office is clean, this book is never far from my elbow. It's the system's view of life. The first six chapters explain to a scientist like me what the history of thought is. And you're exactly right. This is a real paradigm shift. It, it is a really true scientific revolution. People do not understand how consequential this change of view is, but the asker of this question clearly does. 
So in systems thinking in my class, I teach students to always, uh, it, that, it, that the answers you get lie in the questions you ask. This is the kind of question we believe is really important. What is, what is the impact? We have a technique we call the five whys. You just ask why five times. We always stress, anytime we're after answers, we are very conscious of the questions. And we often will do exercises to make sure we're asking the right questions. The students are instructed to see what is there. So that's what we're trained to do. That's the specialization and all of that. But we're also trained, we also ask them, anytime you're asked to see what is there or could be there, always see what is not there. Now that sounds, how can you see what's not there? But who's not at the table? Whose voice is not in the picture? If we're talking about food security, ultimately in the family, who's not speaking? Who's not getting fed? Who's the third meal? Um, so that way of thinking changes everything. And it's very simple, but it is completely unfamiliar to us in a reductionist silver bullet paradigm. And so I think Simit is taking an incredibly important step with this invitation to you to work in scenarios. That's a classic systems tool, right? Work in scenarios. And another, another really important thing, as I said, is when you operate in a silver bullet mode, always make explicit your assumptions because your ability to take a step forward always depends on a set of assumptions. What are those? In our narrow specialized view, we don't articulate those. We are sure that maximizing local output right now is nirvana. Well, when I say it like that, it sounds silly. So these are some um, simple things we teach in my course. And the course is actually on the website uh, to the best of our ability, along with students' writings and reflections that you might really enjoy. For most of the students who take this course, they consider it a transformative journey. They feel they can never see the world the same way again. So it is really uh, important to understand how monumental and visionary the leadership that Simit is applying within the CG context to begin to say, here are our hammers and our traditional nails, but what are we building? And what do we think about what we're building? Because the other message that's been important to me, and I, I teach now in a program called the Ethics of Emerging Military Technologies. Um, and, and as a consequence have thought, learned a lot more about ethics than I certainly was ever taught to know. KSS is meant to be the institution that, that embraces any of you who are trying to operate this way. KSS is built and functions on the new platform. So for any of you who um, are interested as a result of this, who are interested in the property of resilience, please step into the space that KSS at Simit has created for you, knowing that this moment would come, knowing in fact that some shock would hit the system, in this case, it's been COVID, but we knew it was going to be something that would have, a, and, and actually Ebola was a, was a good, uh, it was a bad, but effective illustration that we were right. Unfortunately, COVID has hit. Was it a surprise? Yeah, details were a surprise, but the phenomenon was not a surprise to us sitting in the KSS Foundation. So please, any of you who are interested, um, we, the KSS framework is there because Knowledge Systems for Sustainability, which is what KSS stands for, requires data, models. It specifically understands we're speaking to decisions, whether it's the decision of a farmer or a hungry child in the back of a small house somewhere far away, or a general or a head of state or a researcher, those decisions add up to our learning as a group and outcomes that matter. Thank you, it's Molly. A great question. 
Yeah, thank you, Molly. And I think you, you answered also part of the, of the next question, but I'm still going to ask it. I mean, it's hard to disagree with most of what you have said. How do we avoid paralysis by analysis? Because it's complex, does not absolve us from the responsibility to be working on the solutions while we being aware of the bigger picture. Such a great question. Wow, I am so excited by these questions. Um, so there is a huge difference between those of us who are who are listening to this seminar and giving it and the field and the field that it that is that from which we many of us have come and draw from ecology. There's a huge difference between describing systems and intervening in systems in an applied way with an intentional outcome, which is what all of us in agriculture do because we're all about innovations in real life. Describing a system, analysis by per, or paralysis by analysis, that generally happens for ecologists. I don't mean to trash ecology, but it was an ecologist who said to me at one point early on, she was a Department of Energy, a very eminent ecologist. And I said, you guys have all the boxes with arrows. You've got the right idea. You're seeing the system properly, but you guys never do anything. And every time I show up and say, wow, you're right. Let's do something. You all go like, eh. And she finally said to me, she said, Molly, we became ecologists because we hate people. <laughs> so we keep people out of our picture. We don't like people. We, we like natural areas. However, she said, there's nothing, there's no natural area left on the planet, right? So we have some things to learn about, into, about the need to impose interventions, stresses, shocks on our boxes and arrows. And you need to learn boxes and arrows <laughs> while you're intervening in systems and get honest about what questions you're not asking when you ask certain questions, who's not at the table when you're talking to people who are at the table. And it was so it was a very important conversation. And and I, I have to say, in a CG, there was a lot of efforts drawing those boxes and arrows. And you, you know, really somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to make that horrific spaghetti diagram I showed you from the Department of Defense. Somebody did it, right? But we generally are interveners. We're generally on the ground. And so from my point of view, then the best you can do is just practice what we have come to nickname systems thinking and realize if you're generating knowledge, specific knowledge, you are acting in something that is formally called a knowledge system. Why is knowledge systems for sustainability called knowledge systems, which I thought was super weird. It didn't, it was a frame I didn't understand. Why is because in 2011, I got really frustrated thinking about decision relevant science because I'd been a decision maker. And when it was time for me to make decisions, even when I knew there had been large research investments, I couldn't find what I needed in the research. The research was not decision relevant. And I couldn't understand why we had failed and failed and failed to generate decision relevant information. So I kept bothering the 2009 Nobel laureate in economics. Her name was Lynn Ostrom. And I really, for any of you who are interested in the foundational thinking, I really commend, I'd love to give you uh, another visit with me, fireside chat about why, how she was so important. She studied how human beings manage common pool resources. Well, under the lens of sustainability, everything's a common pool resource, every single thing our atmosphere, our water, our health, everything. We, and, and it rolls up to one planet, right? It's a monumentally consequential area of study for the 21st century, where we understand post Earthrise photo that we're all on this ball in it together, full stop. And she said, oh my gosh, she said, you've arrived, you've arrived. My theory predicted you would arrive and you're here. 
<laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and she said, you are the first scientist to show up who understands that science is beautiful and entertaining and actually has huge consequences, but that it sits in a system of decision making. And she said, you scientists don't understand where your science fits in that larger picture. I'm a political economist and my husband's a philosopher. We understand, she said. And I said, well, I want to do decision relevant science. And she said, oh, that's so wonderful. Um, but if, and if you bring decision making inside the system you're creating, then you have to ditch your first name, which was information infrastructure for sustainability science. And she said, you have to call yourselves knowledge systems for sustainability. You are the first network of scientists and engineers to come to me who understands this. And then her work becomes highly relevant because there are ways that humans can organize to better manage common pool, pool resources. And, and so she said, you scientists don't understand. She said, you're always, always, building for a fight. You're not the fight, but every place you put your work is contested. And that's what she studied. She studied the fight. And so we in science lament that people don't listen to us and why isn't anybody doing anything about climate change, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's because we, in her view, don't understand the action space she operates in, which is we are absolutely warriors. We are in a fight. We don't understand the fight. We don't understand that it's a fight. We don't understand what victory looks like. Um, and so to go back to the first question, in some sense, seeing ourselves accurately, which she did in her theory. <laughs> so she said, you know, you are very special. KSS is very special because you are building for the fight. You understand it's a fight. You understand the importance of decision-making. You're willing to study the interface between your knowledge output and decision-making. And that means, she said, you have a chance at creating learning systems. And so Simmons' unfailing support of the Knowledge Systems for Sustainability Network, the importance of the demonstration projects like Masagro, like national outlook scenarios for Mexico, um, like topics such as maize for Mexico. These are all outputs of the, con of the you know, sort of witches brew we put together. I mean, it's not witches, it's like fairies brew, good people of KSS, where ideas from Australia, for example, which people tend to overlook because it's so far away and upside down, um, came forward, um, they had a brilliant idea of generating national outlook scenarios. Suddenly, Australia could see a set of futures and CIMIT is doing exactly the same thing. When people can see and share a set of visible futures, we start to understand how our choices roll up into outcomes that we either like or don't like. And we understand that we can have an outcome we like, but if 15 million people come migrating into a situation because an earthquake's happened and there's no water in Los Angeles, or uh, we have a drought in Syria, that certain factors such as mass migration can have a monumental impact on situations we thought were just A-OK. -okay. So in systems thinking, we always recognize, just like the tomato example, that the scale you look at a situation determines what you think of it. So Thanks. I'm very excited by, um, yeah, I know we're at time, but I no, think ahead, it has played a crucial role. And I want to just acknowledge that and, and also continues to play a really crucial role with your efforts to imagine how the CG is going to contribute in a post-COVID world. It couldn't be more important. Thanks, Molly, and and, and sorry for for cutting you off there. I was, oh, no, uh, I was too fast. Uh, and um, thanks for everything. Uh, we unfortunately need to wrap up here. But as you all know, the seminar will be available on YouTube. But also, we will publish a Q and A 
to respond to some of the other questions that appeared uh, in the in the chat. Uh, Molly, it was uh, a very, very exciting listening to you. We've never been more proud to be a uh, part <laughs> of uh, the KSS effort. And uh, uh, I, I would just want to say, I think we're all on a journey and let's uh, keep and stick together to, uh, to construct that better world uh, for the future. Uh, please take care of yourself, take care of those that are close to you and let's be gentle. Have a very nice start. <laughs> Goodbye. And keep in touch. I'm available. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Goodbye, good night, good bye afternoon bye. or evening and have a lovely day for those of us in the West. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.